take this with you. Okay. Do you want to take that? Yes. You'll need it. Questions. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to have a discussion, hopefully, with you today. I, I'll rattle through some state of the world in open data, um, hopefully quite quickly, and then we can jump into some discussion. My name is Gavin Starks. I'm the chief executive of the Open Data Institute. Uh, the ODI is just coming up for its second birthday. We're an independent non-profit company um, set up by Sir Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the web, and Sir Nigel Shadbolt, uh, with the remit to try and work out what to do with all the open data that is uh, coming into the world. And I think one of the things that we're very interested in at, trying to ask is what problems can we solve with open data? And there's an interesting sort of timing piece here, which I, I find quite useful to think about where we are in this sort of cycle of open data today versus the web uh, 20 years ago. So the web's 25th anniversary this year, and uh, obviously we've seen phenomenal growth over uh, the last 25 years. And if we think about the launch of data.gov.uk five years ago as being the kind of a start point, open data has been around for a lot longer, but a kind of starting point, we're about five or six years into the kind of open data movement. And if we think about the last 25 years as of building a web of documents, what's the web of data going to look like in 20 years from now? The amount of data that's being produced is, is doubling every couple of years at the moment. But let's be very clear what we mean by open data. It's not big data, it's not personal data. Actually, explicitly, it's data that can be used by anyone for any purpose for free. Um, so we explicitly exclude personal data, so your individual health records, for example, should never be open data um, unless you give explicit informed consent to that. Uh, and big data is a phrase that I think a lot of us would like to go away because it is a bit meaningless. Um, it's bigger than yesterday, I don't know, bigger than you put, can put in a spreadsheet, bigger than you used to, um, etc. So. The kind of question, though, that I'm very interested in is how are we going to scale society and how can open data actually help us tackle some of the greatest challenges of our time? And what is that challenge? The challenge is to try and sustain more than 7 billion people uh, on the planet. That's an awful lot of people, a lot of people who need power, who need energy, uh, who need food, who need water. We need to deal with their education, their shelter, transport, their health, their jobs. And at the same time, we've got this rhetoric. It's almost like we've hit peak, peak. Almost like you hear about peak oil. Uh, we're also, you know, peak uranium 2030, peak phosphorus 2025. So that's quite bad for farming. Um, peak copper, although we can mine some of that back out of the landfill. So we're, we're hitting sort of peak resource all over the place. Um, and we're not very good at actually trying to work out how we can scale on a per capita basis. So the, the kind of rule of thumb here is if everybody had the same sort of lifestyle as the US or the UK, we need several planets worth of uh, resource. So that's not going to work. We've also got cities scaling at an, a huge rate. So more than 50% of the world's population currently lives in cities. This is going to grow to 70 or 80% over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, in China, they're, they're creating, I think, more than 100 cities that have got more than 10 million people in them. Uh, over the next decade or something. It's some phenomenal uh, rate. And in, even in London, you have maybe 10% growth uh, in the population every decade. So for London, that's an, an extra million people over the next 10 years and the next 10 years and so on. Um, so that, that gives you some sense of we can't just keep with sort of business as usual. And at the same time, we've got this huge move towards open data. And that can be social data, it can be population, could be health information, could be transport, uh, could be your own user-generated content that you choose to make open, could be environmental data, so you could be looking at weather, you could be looking at farming, you could be looking at pollution uh, or resource scarcity, as I mentioned, um, and you've got economic data being made available. You've got corporate information being published. Companies House in the UK is going to start publishing all of the uh, corporate accounts in the UK as open data, so another level of transparency that we're not used to. Um, Interesting, that sort of social contract is companies were originally created to have limited liability in return for transparency. We seem to have forgotten that sort of along the way. Um, and this uh, you know, applies to new forms of uh, trade and, and commerce like peer-to-peer -peer lending, uh, 
it applies to where assets are uh, and much more corporate stuff. At the ODI, we've, uh, we incubate startups. We've had 17 startups through the uh, program so far. One of them identified a potential £200 million saving for the uh, National Health Service by looking at drugs, looking at prescriptions, and how many prescriptions of a particular class could be switched from uh, patented drugs to generics. The price difference is £20 versus 70 pence for the drug in question. Um, and even uh, taking out the clinical cases where you need those drugs, uh, the patented drugs uh, for the patients, you can still save hundreds of millions of pounds. Um, and that was derived in a, a matter of weeks by a handful of people. The next stage of that, obviously, is what do you do about it? How do you engage with the 1.1 million person bureaucracy that is the NHS to, to make the change? Similarly, we've got a company called Open Corporates uh, that are mapping all of the companies in the world. They've got data for 78 million companies now. And they can do things like beneficial ownership, ownership maps of banks. So with Goldman Sachs, this map, which you can just see on the screen here, um, resizes the countries based on where the greatest number of subsidiaries are. And the large blob in the middle at the bottom there is the Cayman Islands. So you can see a huge number. And you've got the UK, Luxembourg, Cayman Islands, and the US. If you look at this map, this is for Goldman Sachs. If you look at it for Bank of America, very different picture. Um, most of the ownership there is inside the US. And you can draw whatever conclusions you like from that. Um, we also brought together the peer-to-peer -peer lenders uh, in the UK and analyzed 400 million pounds worth of spend data, looked at who was lending, who was borrowing. Uh, unsurprisingly, most of the lending was being done from the southeast, but most of the borrowing was uniform across the country. And that really highlights that the high street banks are not lending to a huge chunk of the market here. And this helped the Bank of England think about how it could be data intensive in policy light. So this is kind of open data hitting the financial world and helping them ask questions about how could we regulate different, differently? How could we use data to police rather than coming down with policy that may kill markets? Um, similarly, analyzing government and public spending across Europe. Uh, the UK is particularly bad at receiving money quickly out of Europe. Um, there's roughly 22 billion pounds worth of cash that takes nine months to get from Europe into the UK, uh, compared with about three months for other countries uh, like Poland. Uh, so we uh, don't fare too well there. Um, also, tools that can help policymakers and citizens make decisions about their public services. So this is an analysis of uh, the fire station closures in London, looking at the response times. The number in the top left there is the response time of a fire engine to your area. And what happens, you can go through and select which fire stations you want to close, and it will tell you what the difference in response rate is. So it gives you a, a different sense of engagement around how you can um, not only help the policymakers, but how you can engage the general public to say, actually, closing this fire station isn't going to change the response time in your area. Um, in this case, we also combine it with um, footfall data from Telefonica, looking at the actual population densities in different areas uh, in the city, because um, they're radically different from the actual uh, residential population. So you might have 100,000 people living there, but a million people that work there uh, during the day. Um, let's skip through those. One of the big uh, pieces here that we are very interested in is the cultural change. We don't really see open data as a technology problem. We see it as a behavior change problem and a cultural problem. We've been closed by default for well, really since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And our patent and IP laws have reinforced this notion of closed is better. But there's a lot of evidence now that open is much better. I think we're all familiar with the open web. It's far more powerful and has had far greater impact through being open than through being closed. And we are at a very interesting uh, inflection point here where we can choose to be more open or we can choose to uh, maintain the status quo around whether we have open by default or uh, closed by default. And that's something we've embraced at the ODI. So these are some of the figures from our own uh, accounts. So how much value we've unlocked, how much income we make, how many people we've reached, how many people we've trained, etc. And I think we're trying to lead by example here in, in, in identifying how can we quantify 
impact from a triple bottom line perspective. So looking at social impacts, looking at environmental impacts, uh, and economic impacts. And social impact could be just greater transparency, could be better services, could be better public engagement, like the fire station story, could be open innovation in the uh, economic sector, bringing operational efficiency, like in the NHS example, um, and environmental impact. So how do, can we really pull together the different data sources? Uh, how, how would we find, how would we know exactly how much uh, oil reserves, coal reserves, copper reserves exist, and mash that into an application that you're making a, that interfaces then with a product design tool? So if you're going to make a new fridge and there's going to be a billion people across India and Africa that want a fridge over the next 10 to 20 years, how are we going to make those uh, devices? Because there simply isn't enough material. Where's that innovation going to come from? And so from our point of view at the Open Data Institute, we think it's time to really build the open data ecosystem at web scale. And I think what we've seen over the last 18 months of our own existence is a huge amount of interest. We've seen the G8, or now the G7, sign an open data charter mandating that certain data sets like mining, extractives, corporate information, maps, geo information is, is open. That's likely to be adopted by the G20 this year. <clears throat> and that's going to likely then be followed through by the OECD. So you've got this top-down pressure that we didn't have during the web. We've got a lot of the engineering of the web, I think, right, because the political establishment simply didn't understand what was happening. This is very different in that context in that this is being driven by a political agenda as well as a grassroots uh, agenda. We found that um, there's a huge amount of interest from governments, from NGOs, but also from companies. Uh, we've trained about 400 people actually over the last year. And a lot of, lots of them have been uh, lawyers uh, or executives in uh, telecommunications companies, etc., who are really trying to understand what does this mean for their uh, business and how can they actually engage in it and be part of this kind of revolution around open data. Um, we've also been blown away by a lot of international interest. We've got 20 international open data institutes now in 13 countries uh, right across the world, including Moscow, including Seoul, uh, Osaka, Dubai, places you wouldn't necessarily think as being particularly open. And we've got a program with the World Bank. Again, it's all very sort of top-down stuff of saying, how can we train the world's political leaders to develop open data policies? So we've done work in Burkina Faso, which has helped them map all the schools and release that as open data so parents can make better choices about where the schools are and how well they're performing. And like I say, there's a lot of corporate engagement here as well. I'm going to finish on a couple of points before we break to questions. Uh, one is that in order to try and link together all the open data that's being published, there isn't a particularly good mechanism or hasn't been a particularly good mechanism to do that. So one of the things we've created is called an open data certificate. Uh, it's free, it's open source. Uh, you can uh, use it as a data publisher to say, here is my URL. It, is, it has an open license and I will commit to it being available for a year and questions around the sort of metadata about what you're publishing that enable that data to be discovered by data users and used more by those users. And so we're very keen to see people experiment with this to uh, adopt them. The UK government has adopted uh, them and we're starting to see now uh, people like the Met Office and um, Ordnance Survey, et cetera, publishing data with open data certificates. Um, we're also starting to see private companies uh, publish uh, data with open data certificates as well. And again, what this enables is, the ideal here is that Google will start to be able to index these certificates and therefore enable the discovery of data much more easily than it is today. Um, and the other call to action is if anybody's working in open data, we invest, we have substantial amounts of funds uh, to invest in communication, uh, and uh, we invest heavily in telling the stories. Uh, some of the examples I gave earlier, uh, we've had national coverage in the UK and around the world. We've been on the front page of the Financial Times and so on, really trying to raise the visibility of open data's relevance to everyone, not just a sort of fringe activity that's happening in the geek or sort of web community. It's not, this is really front and center in the political community and really front and center in the business community. So 
lots of challenges there. The main one is how do we scale? How do we get millions more people into cities? How do we do that in a sustainable fashion? How do we provide food, energy, etc., for everyone? But also, how do we make sure that this remains open? So uh, how, how do we uh, avoid this sort of net neutrality debate around open data? How do we convince companies that open is more powerful than closed? These are really big challenges. And we are in this, again, uh, to just finish where I started, on this inflection point. We have the grassroots community who've been working on this for decades. We've got the political sphere who sort of understand the principle but they don't understand the technology. And companies who largely are confused or threatened by change uh, and are quite cautious, but will default to close unless we really help them be more open. So lots of open questions there about how can we make this a global movement? How can we really engage in a broad ecosystem? And how, what sort of problems could, do we think we could solve to demonstrate and provide the use cases for the power of open data? Thank you very much. I know I did that very quickly indeed. Okay, we're just going to open the floor to questions now. So um, if anyone has a question here, just please raise your hand. Uh, if not, I'm going to... Oh, yes, hello, sir. Great. Okay, just two seconds, can I just go bring this to you? So what are the main groups, like companies, organizations, against this open data concept? And how do you deal with that? Is it a problem? Are you trying to get new open data, or are you just using the data that already exists? Um, we're both trying to use the, uh, demonstrate the value in what already exists, because that helps demonstrate what's possible, as well as open up new data sets. I, I wouldn't say com companies aren't really against it, so to speak. It's more of a cultural thing of, like, we have just closed by default as a way of operating. And it'd be really interesting if I was standing here saying, Let's imagine a world where everything was already open. Like when we published our accounts, it was already open. When we published our research, it was all completely open. Um, let's imagine that was already the case. And I was standing here from the Closed Data Institute th saying, we should really close all this information down. You don't think I was completely crazy, right? But we have developed this over the last couple of hundred years as a way of working, largely down to our uh, intellectual property uh, laws. Um, so I think the challenge for companies, particularly big companies, is that they're very risk averse. Actually, they might feel like big companies are very kind of behemoth who will try and own everything, but they're not going to do the innovation because it's too risky. So we need to bring together the startup companies, the innovators, um, the NGOs, and the rest of the community to say, actually, the sky isn't going to fall if this happens. You know, let, what are the use, what are the benign use cases we could start with, and then gradually get more confident uh, as we go forward. So I, I think that's really the, the challenge. So that's one, one category. The other category of people, which is the vast majority of the world, has no idea this is happening. So that, that's the, the bigger challenge, is almost just raising awareness at all. And one of the big uh, challenges I think we face is when you mention data to people, they either think of um, care.data or personal data and the kind of bad PR you get around that, or Snowden or WikiLeaks or Facebook or something that actually is quite different from what we're trying to achieve here. So there's a, a real threat, I think, of sort of poisoning the well for a lot of the good work that, and, and good outcomes that open data can, can bring. So many, many challenges. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's one of the problems, is not just a kind of a moral thing that people want to be closed or whatever, but if it's um, a bit of a hassle, maybe perceived as a hassle and expense to release data for a public body or for a company, and then either perhaps people don't necessarily use it much or that if there might be value that accrues to society in the use of that data, but the value is not accruing hmm. to the organization that's got the hassle of releasing. Yeah, so that the hassle and the, and the cost question is something we encounter all the time. And there's some really interesting evidence now to say open is cheaper. Um, it's better quality. Um, so as soon as you start engaging with people who might be interested in the data that you've got, they start to care more about the data they're getting because they can provide direct feedback and, and fix things if it's broken, same as, same as Wikipedia. Um, and the people who are producing the data in the first place suddenly realize that they have an audience rather than just having a spreadsheet on their desktop, which is remarkably 
common still today um, in the academic world and in the, in the public sector and, and the private sector, is the information simply isn't captured. And if it's captured then and put into a closed system, that closed system eventually atrophies, bit rot sets in, and we just lose, lose the information forever. So it's a major challenge, again, it's, well, it's back, back to behavior change, to say open is cheaper, better, and more usable than closed. And, and that's a, a huge thing to try and communicate through, through these sort of um, existing barriers. A lot of people are terrified that when they publish their data, people will find mistakes. And we need to cultivate a culture of uh, failure being OK, mistakes being OK. Because the mistakes are already there. Right? We just don't know them. And if, if we don't know that the mistakes are there, then nobody's going to fix them. So we're already using bad data. Or we might be using good data. We simply don't know. Right? But data isn't going to get worse quality and have less utility if it's open. Yes. Hi, my question sort of follows on from that, which is, don't you think that uh, the technology such as RDFs and OWL too, I'm talking about the semantic web yes. and, and say RDF and OWL and all those sort of things which don't really have a problem. So in other words, there's no real language, so people don't want to invest in it because there's not a, a standard in which you can sit there and go, well, I can write all this in OWL or OWL2. I probably have to write the compiler, and then next year it'll all be changed, and I'll have to do it all again. Well, a, a bit like every software language that's ever existed, maybe. But I think no, the, the principle here, from my point of view, would be put the data online, put it up there as a CSV file, but give it an open data certificate so we can find it. If it's online and it's licensed, the key question here isn't, about the format. The format is an important question, but it's almost a secondary question right now. The, the major challenge we face is simply getting the data published and licensed as being open in the first place. And it's that licensing piece that is the big gap right now. Is there's lots of data. Like in the US, there is no open government license. There's no equivalent of crown copyright. If you dig into it, public domain in the US means public domain inside the US. Right, so they're actively looking at CC0, uh, Creative Commons 0 uh, license as a way of actually licensing some, some of their own public domain data. So the licensing piece is the really one of the big anchor points here because a company isn't going to invest in using data if they don't know for sure that they've got the license to use it. So if it's online, I don't really care whether it's a CSV file or an RDF or an XML or whatever the thing is, as long as it's addressable. And that's one problem that we have resolved because we have URIs. If you have a URI and a license, the data formats can then be machine read and machine manipulated after that point. And it will be messy, but it will at least be a mess that we can find. Hi there, thanks. Um, I just wanted to go back to the point earlier about value accrual, really. Um, when you were talking, I was thinking about um, a, a, a recent book by Thomas Piketty, um, Capital in the 21st Century. And one of his theses in that book is that one of the potential dangers f for us in the 21st century is that more and more value gets accrued to a smaller and smaller section of society. And I was wondering, do you see open data as a way of, of countering that? And so that's the first question. And then if so, is there a group of people who are actually against this, or if when they understand it, likely to oppose this uh, shift? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, I think to answer the first question broadly, yes, I, I do see this as, as part of the general web culture, which is a m more of a socially driven movement. It's more about many parts loosely joined than aggregating and centralizing power. However, we see that, we see this in everything that we've ever created, and you're seeing it in the web right now, is that we are creating centers of power in Google or Facebook or um, the CIA or, or, or whoever happens to have the, the sort of the connection point. So will this happen with open data? Yes, it will in some way, because you know, once we make all the data indexable, Google will, and Bing and all the others, will create great search engines, which means we can find it. So my question then is, you know, what's the additionality? What, what 
problems are we able to, to solve uh, after that? Again, central to this is actually uh, the net neutrality piece. So we have to have an open web. And if we, if we lose the open web, we will lose all of the value, not only of the web, but all of the potential value, I think, for, for open data. So I think that there's a really interesting tension there. And your second question about who will, who will oppose it? Well, companies uh, um, typically are opposed uh, if they feel threatened. Uh, they will maybe try and acquire, as is often the case, they'll try and acquire the small startup who's going to disrupt their business model. Um, but then we've got a good, one thing that's different from, say, 1995, looking at the web, is we can look back at the web and say, well, this has happened before. We've done this in every sector. We've done it in the media and entertainment industry. We've done it in the newspaper world. We're, we're doing it, it across a whole range of different sectors. And it's almost ironic in, in some ways that it's taken us 25 years to come back round to data uh, and, and treat it as a category you know, of, of information in its own right. So I think certainly there will be incumbent organizations that will feel threatened. Some of them may go down acquisitive and uh, more aggressive type uh, roads. I think the more progressive companies will look at this and go, oh, I think we could probably save half a billion pounds if we did, for example, open clinical trials in the health industry rather than doing closed trials, which cost fortunes to do and produce quite small sample sets. There's probably better research and there's better outcomes. And actually, everybody wants those kind of better outcomes. The question then is what happens around the IP? And I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot to be learned from the open source movements to say what transition did we go through to say that the software uh, IP isn't important, but software as a service is the business model. So you've separated out the licensing from the paying for the service. And in the long term, you know, open source has won. You know, it, it's, it's kind of, in my, in my view anyway, um, has won a lot of categories because it, the sheer force of numbers. And that's where we have a lot um, to really think about hard because as I've been trying to outline is, this is different to the early days of the web in that it includes the companies and the governments already. Uh, they're already looking at this, and government's already, already legislating for this. So it's a really interesting uh, balance. So. Go ahead. I guess this, thanks very much. It's, I guess it's led by governments at the moment. Do you, uh, I think it's led by companies? governments and grassroots in the same way the web has been. For, and I think the governments are paying attention because of the grassroots piece. Mm -hmm. And you look at the work that uh, Government Digital Services has done in the UK, and the history of that from the late 90s sort of activists through, well, a pause of while well, people digested what the hell was happening to government digital service now exists and is reinventing what the web looks like for, for government in a very significant way. And again, pointing, being able to point at that as an example, this is the transition you've been through over the last 20 years is really useful to say, well, there's another transition we're going to go through here. So I think it has been driven by the grassroots community, the political sphere has adopted it because it ticks certain transparency and public good boxes. But there's also, uh, if you watch, uh, if anyone remem remembers uh, Yes Minister, if you watch uh, the very first episode of Yes Minister, it's actually about open data. And they get to a point in the, in the episode where there's some data being released which will make the minister look bad. Uh, and of course the minister then says, no, we shouldn't publish that data. And you, you see that pattern in governments when governments come into power, the first year they love the open data because it points out how bad the previous guys were. And the second year they don't like it as much because it shows how bad they're doing, right? And that just requires brave politicians. And we need to really support our politicians in their um, push to keep the data open. And actually, Francis Maud uh, in the cabinet office has been a massive supporter uh, of the open data movement. I've, I've, and I've been very genuinely surprised by that. Anyone else have any other questions yet? No, I think, oh, just one, one more. more, and then we'll probably just wrap up, wrap up after that. Um, is there anything from history um, that says why we have gone down the path that we currently are on? The, the open data path or the, no, the closed data path? The Industrial Revolution. Oh, right. Um, What's my favourite line is that uh, 
the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Um, so I think the, the cycle here for me is, is very familiar. It, it, it's cent centralization, decentralization, aggregation, disaggregation. Um, we're seeing that in, you could look at the British Empire and the way that it sort of tried to hoover up massive amounts of power and then disaggregated. You could look at it in the way that now even Scotland wants to become independent. Um, you could look at the huge number of electricity providers that existed in the UK at the early 1900s that then aggregated and now we have six, some of which are not in the UK. Um, and now we're seeing a tr transition to uh, renewable energy where actually we can redistribute the energy generation and we can do peer-to-peer -peer energy and we've got a startup at the ODI called Open Utility who's trying to do exactly that. So we, we can look at these sort of cycles and I think we're seeing the same thing with um, personal data. You know, personal data currently is centralized in Facebook and Google. It can be decentralized through the personal data store initiatives and the sort of my data initiatives where you, you, you could get the control of your data and then you choose to license it back to Facebook rather than the other way around. So I think we just see these patterns all the time across everything we do, whether it's international trade, whether it's energy, or uh, whether it's the web. It's just happening faster. And I think that's the big change. It's when it comes to um, open data, if we think back 20 years, um, the web took quite a long time to reach where it is today because the technology wasn't quite there. We didn't have ubiquitous broadband, and we didn't have one of these in everybody's hands. Um, now everybody has a supercomputer in their pocket. They have access to uh, super, uh, multiple supercomputers in the cloud for pennies a minute. Um, they can connect with everybody else in the world at a fast speed. And so the pace of change is going to be faster than the web, in my view. You know, it's a, there's a lot of other caveats around that, but I think the cycles continue. They just shorten in, in uh, frequency, if that helps. Okay, I think that's pretty much it. I'm just going to show on a question of my own, if, if I can, actually, please. Right. Uh, so you've spoken about open data as a kind of, in some ways, almost like a gift from government to here's how you, you, you can kind of hold us to account better. That's not the same as having a right. So when it stops being convenient for you, uh, it, what's stopping the government's basically close data back down again when it stops be making them, them, them look good, really? Well, uh, this is an, one of the most important things, actually, about getting... Um, companies involved in using that data because if companies are totally dependent on government publishing open data then there are jobs that are dependent on that data and governments really don't want to be responsible for shutting down the innovation and shutting down um, job creation and, and you know, just to give one extreme example of that um, in the US uh, some ex-Google uh, folks went and set up a company called the Climate Corporation uh, and they use US data around the environment, around um, weather, uh, climate, uh, around soil, et cetera. And they created a micro insurance industry for, far uh, insurance industry for uh, farmers. Uh, so um, farmers could get very micro specific insurance policies for their farms across the US. So that business was almost entirely based on open data. They didn't actually publish any open data. They consumed it and made stuff. Monsanto bought them for $930 million. Right? Now, that's a very strong argument in terms of open innovation, job creation, and economic value creation for a government to actually say, here is a tick. Now, the specifics you may have different opinions on about maybe it would be nice if they published open data as well. Um, and maybe that will come back round as we realise that everything becomes better if we're open. Okay, cool. um, everyone, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, please put your hands together for Gavin. Cheers. Thank you. Now.